Yo, what up? We're back, baby. We're finna get into um, UFC Norfolk. Pretty excited for this card. You know, I've always been a big fan of the uh, flyweight division. I really like uh, what they do, you know. I know uh, the UFC doesn't seem to uh, like flyweights too much. A lot of casual fans don't really like the flyweights. But, man, I mean, fuck, dude. I mean, they're not really giving, giving doing the flyweights any favors on this card. They're going to put the title on this card and... Man, I mean, uh, terrible heavyweight fight. Uh, they got a couple good fights, but two 145 fights on the main. It's like they, uh, UFC, like Dana was sitting around with everybody, and they're like, you know, like, what are the two shittiest divisions we got in the UFC? You know, uh, let's just throw them all on one fucking card, you know? So then they all put them on this card, I guess. Felicia Spencer, Megan Anderson, Joe B, Deveson, the whole crew. So they got all these, all these fools on this card, uh. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, so we'll see, uh, how far they truly, you know, start marketing this, uh, flyweight division and all that, but the, the main event's an extremely good fight, and, uh, I'm really looking forward to that, it's, uh, Joe B's, probably his final chance to win the belt, if he loses there, I would imagine, maybe he would even retire, win or lose, you know, that would be a great way to, uh, go into the sunset with the win, and if he loses... You know, what more does he really have to prove there? So I do kind of feel like maybe we're going to see the retirement of Joe B on Saturday night. But before that, we have a lot of uh, fights on the card to discuss. So we're going to get right into it. But make sure to, uh, you know, comment, like, subscribe. Uh, and, uh, you know, share the video. Share it with your friends if they're in MMA. Uh, try to uh, build this community up. And, uh, yeah, so thanks for always supporting, guys. And uh, like I said, make sure to comment, like, subscribe. But the first fight of the night, it is going to be Ishmael Nardiev taking on Sean Brady. And Nardiev, he did bounce back from his first UFC loss. He had a pretty resounding, dominant victory over uh, C.R. Bahardurzada. He dominated basically every second of that fight. He even got a 30-24 on a scorecard. And he has a lot of raw ability, and he's 23 years old. He has a ton of potential. Now he's training out there at Sanford MMA, which is uh, the new name for Hard Knocks 365. So Kamar Usman, Henry Hooft is the coach, everyone out there. And he definitely is the coaches, the training partners to make it to the next level. So now it's just going to be up to him performing. And Sean Brady, he entered the UFC. He was undefeated, a lot of hype. And he didn't get an easy opponent in his UFC debut. He faced an aging guy, but a tough veteran in Court McGee. It was a hard fight. It was uh, fairly close, but uh, Brady clearly edged the fight. And uh, this is an interesting matchup because Nardiev is the faster guy. He's more fast twitch, better kicks. He can kick moving backwards, laterally. He can kick to the head, to the body, to the legs. So very, very diverse with his kicks. And um, his hands aren't bad, but he does leave his chin high. He can be clipped with left hooks especially, which Brady throws very tight. So I kind of feel like that's going to be a big thing in this fight. And Nardiev, uh, for him, I believe he needs to keep the distance with the kicks, land, angle, never stay stationary. And uh, if this gets into the pocket, you know, I just feel like Brady is tighter with the punches. I think Brady's going to be trying to use uh, forward pressure, cut the cage off, uh, low kicks, left hooks, force Nardiev to trade in boxing range. One thing I don't like about Brady, though, is uh, he tends to throw leg kicks almost immediately after being hit with a low kick, which that can be easily countered or seen on tape. So I feel like he kind of needs to get rid of that tendency, but he's good at catching kicks. He's good at blocking and countering kicks. That's how he dropped Court McGee, which will definitely be available in this fight against a high-volume kicker like Ishmael Nardiev. And uh, for Nardiev, in his last fight, he did get a few takedowns along with uh, Brady did as well. But, you know... Um, if Nardiev can get takedowns, if he can control on top, he's probably going to win the fight. I would say he does have the better takedown shots like singles and doubles. But the issue is I feel Brady is very big. He's strong for the weight class. Very heavy hips. And uh, maybe he could even get some takedowns of his own, you know, in the clinch or by catching a kick. I actually think this is a tough matchup for Nardiev because he's facing a stout, sharp boxer who cuts the cage off well, um, who's explosive, who's durable. And he probably won't be able to hide his bad boxing defense for three rounds or rely on the takedowns like he did for CR. Nardiev, he likes to use his body to avoid punches, you know, leaning back. Uh, and he keeps his feet very close together. Uh, if he gets hit while he's doing that, he's going to go night-night, you know. And he's always dangerous. He has a chance to land flying knees, spinning attacks that, you know, can end the fight. But I'm actually going to go with Sean Brady by second-round TKO. I think that... Uh, 
Nardiev gasses out a little bit as well. And I think as he starts to slow down with his movement, his kicks aren't coming quite as fast or as sharp or his kicks start getting caught and he starts getting a little bit gun shy to throw him. I think that at that point, Brady's going to start getting him in the boxing ranges. And I think that he's going to be able to land some big shots. I think that he's going to be able to really exploit and expose the boxing defense of Ishmael Nardiev. So uh, I'm pretty confident in this pick. I know he's the underdog, but uh, my pick's going to be Sean Brady via TKO. And uh, up next, we have a fight. Two guys making their debuts, Long Cruz, Spike Carlisle. And, um, you know, Long Cruz, he is entering the day his debut with a lot of momentum. He arguably had the best KO in the history of the Dana White Contender Series. You know, it, he had a beautiful flying knee knockout late in round three. And uh, he might have been losing that fight, so it was uh, very, 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 uh, you know, uh, very, it was like a clutch thing to do because he got the contract and, uh, you know, he kind of uh, was about to lose and he kind of got the win right there. But at six foot, he's a 78 inch reach. He's a huge featherweight and he was supposed to face Steven Peterson here, but Peterson's forced out of the fight due to injury and, uh. You know, Cruz, he's going to be the more technical striker. He will switch stances, uh, decent footwork. He has a long reach, but he isn't the best puncher. He does have a good one-two. He'll throw a, you know, a check hook overhand right. He doesn't really have the best defense in boxing range or when he gets backed up. And he does throw very nice kicks, though. He has nice low kicks, front leg side kicks, front kicks, round kicks, body head, question mark kicks, spinning kicks, jump kicks, jump knees. So he has a big arsenal of kicks. He kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, Jonathan Martinez. And he did show the ability to fight moving backwards. His last fight, he does fight for all three rounds he has two knockouts and he's never been finished by strikes and he will look to mix it up but in this one I imagine he's going to keep it on the feet he is solid in the clinch he'll dig double underhook circle to the back look for trips he can shoot some bad takedowns when he's pressured and he was shooting some unset up double legs in his last match that were not uh ideal to see but he can be taken down as well uh he has good get ups but he will give his back to stand up he has been uh caught in a rear naked choke twice in his career and submitted and he does have two submissions himself he is a dog he has good cardio but to me he seems uh, pretty average but i would say he has a fairly easy matchup here spike carlisle he answered the short notice call and he is going to be headed to norfolk february 29th but he's normally a lightweight he did decide to make the drop here he only has two fights at featherweight in his career he's one and one there his one career featherweight loss is very alarming because it was a split decision loss um, to a guy who was 8 and 11, which is a terrible record. And he only has 9 fights, but it's a little bit deceiving because he has a lot of, uh, amateur experience. His first amateur fight was in 2011. He's 9 and 5 as an amateur. And, uh, he's an extremely aggressive guy. He's dangerous early. 5 of his 8 wins have came in round 1. And there isn't a ton of footage on him, but from what I've seen, I'm not really impressed. He comes out fast, uh, he'll cross the distance with punches, he throws a lot of kicks, but he holds his hands low. He will throw, you know, some nice round kicks, front kicks, body head, uh, he has a decent left hook, he, his straight right hand isn't bad. He did land a pretty nice spinning back fist in a recent fight that did knock his opponent out. But his defense is not good, and he isn't he isn't a UFC level striker to me. His hands are completely down. His he's very wild, kind of unrefined. He is dangerous himself. He does have four first round knockouts, but uh, you know I just don't know about his striking. He does have two KOs in under one minute, and uh, he's an opportunistic grappler, but he doesn't look great in that area either. His takedown defense looks questionable. He relies on uh, guillotines to counter takedowns. He will pull guard with the guillotine. Definitely, you can see he has faith in his jiu-jitsu. He will attack triangles, arm bars. Uh, he'll, um, you know, give up position to uh, attack the submissions. And, you know, he can give up his back in the mountain scrambles. He can make mistakes when he's grappling, going for low-level subs. And I've seen him lose... Uh, lose due to get take lose to get <laughs> lose due to getting taken down on the regional scene before but uh he will go for takedowns he'll shoot double legs he likes to attack singles uh get you to the fence chain wrestle uh, i have seen him hit some nice throws in the clinch and when he gets uh 
on top, he likes to take the back at rear nakeds of his own. He has some ground and pound uh, finishes for mount as well. And in a recent LFA fight, he was able to get uh, some early takedowns, but he couldn't really control position. Um, he did keep a heavy dose of takedowns up in that fight. Showed good cardio, but he was almost desperate to try to get it to the ground. And uh, I feel like a better opponent might have made him pay for a game plan like that. But I will say that, you know, Spike comes to fight, he's very dogged. And, uh, you are you know, you're going to really have to get him out of there to beat him. He does have three submissions of his own. His uh, cardio looks a little bit questionable, though. He does look like he gets tired as the fight goes on. But this is an interesting fight because Spike is going to bring it. Uh, Cruz can fight moving backwards, but if Spike gets inside, he could maybe get a takedown or land some shots. He's always going to be looking for the kill, uh, attacking, spinning, and... Uh, you know, Cruz is going to be way better on the outside. He's going to be able to land straights, kicks, knees. And if he can get his range, I definitely see him, you know, starting to pick apart uh, uh, Spike, maybe knocking him out. And uh, I'm going to pick Cruz uh, by KO in this one. And uh, up next, we have another uh, pretty fun fight with uh, TJ Brown taking on Jordan Griffin. And Jordan Griffin, you know, he has his back against the wall here. He's gone 0-2 in his first two UFC starts. He has faced two very tough competitors, but now he's facing a UFC newcomer. It's time to put up or shut up here. Needs a win. Needs to perform to stick around. And uh, He's a southpaw, good distance striker. He likes to use a lot of lateral movement on the outside, kind of explode in with straight punches. Decent jab, good straight left hand. He will throw one-twos, uh, good jab, overhand left. And he's very aggressive. He's pretty quick closing the distance. When he can back opponents up against the cage, he will throw wide hooks in combination. He tries to close off the exits by, you know, predicting which side you're going to try to escape on and throwing a hook that side. And in round three, if he feels the fight's close, he will start to put the pressure on, try to force exchanges. Uh, definitely has good cardio. Nice short hooks, uppercuts, pretty powerful. Dangerous kicks as well. He'll throw a 1-2 to rear leg body or head kicks. But if you could time his blitzes, fires can duck under, get easy takedowns. His uh, defense is not very good either. But he does have good power. He has five knockouts, good chin. He's a wild man. He's only been KO'd one time in his career. And he's a decent grappler offensively. He's very explosive. Good double legs. He'll get big slams, uh, body locks, and very aggressive on the ground. He'll jump on rear naked chokes with no hooks in. Very good squeeze. Uh, a lot of ground and pound. He likes to stand up in opponent's guards and uh, land big punches. Definitely has a good reach. His aggressiveness going for chokes can get him in trouble though. He'll go for flying guillotines, end up on his back. He can hold on to chokes for too long and allow opponents to escape and transition to dominant positions. And he definitely is too calm on bottom. You know, he can give up mount, give up the back pretty easily. He's calm in those positions and will move on the bottom, avoid huge damage, uh, get out of very tight submissions. I mean, this guy is very hard to submit, but he loses rounds due to that. His takedown defense is poor. He was taken down multiple times per round by Dan Ige and Chas Skelly. He will never break, though, and he's going to be there until the end. Uh, he has eight submissions. He has been submitted twice. I feel he should strike in this matchup. You know, try to keep it on the feet um, early on, counter Browns. He tries to get inside. Get the feel of his speed and what to do. And if he can deny a few takedowns, uh, get Brown tired, then he could start pressuring, start coming in with those blitzes, and maybe he'll be able to catch TJ. But TJ Brown, he's worked his way to the UFC the hard way. I mean, Brown doesn't have the prettiest record, 14-6, and six, but he's been thriving lately, 5-1 and one in his last six MMA fights. And he also won uh, some kickboxing fights, some boxing fights in uh, 2019. Brown seemed to have hit a stride in that year. You know, he's going to be looking to bring that into 2020. He was 4-0 in MMA with four finishes in 2019. And his last victory was on the Contender Series. That was the one that earned him the UFC contract. The first thing that you notice when you watch TJ Brown is definitely his aggressiveness, his explosiveness early in rounds. He can come out hot, uh, both with the striking and the grappling. Pretty explosive. He could switch stances. Good jab. He will double triple up on that jab to get into range. Heavy one twos, good hooks, nasty head kicks. 
And he's won uh, via head kick in two of his last four fights. The problem on the feet with Brown to me is he's very aggressive. He's willing to get in wars. He will overextend a little bit in the pocket with his punches. He will also lead with the uppercut, which is always dangerous. And he can get countered by clean boxers. Uh, he got dropped with a really nice 1-2 early on in his last fight against Dylan Lockhart. And uh, he has been knocked out before. He has uh, four knockouts himself, but he's been finished by strikes three times. So definitely could say he's a little bit hittable. But uh, he's a very good grappler. He's extremely strong. He manhandles opponents. And uh, very nice takedowns and a lot of variety with them. He'll hit them with uh, traditional wrestling shots in the clinch, sacrifice throws. And he's excellent in top position. Great control. He'll slow cook opponents. Slowly advance position. He'll land hard punches, elbows. Very good at using the front headlock position to uh, snap opponents back down, control them. He'll uh, trap a wrist from side control. Kind of that wrestling ride position, land big shots from there. And uh, his go-to submission is his arm triangle. He's very good with it. He has six in his career. Um, he also has good back takes. And in that position, he more likes to flatten opponents out, uh, rain down ground and pound. And then uh, he will lock in rear naked chokes if he can't get the finish with the strikes. Very good in scrambles. And uh, when, he can, when, he can get on the, when he can get in on the legs, he usually will end up on top. I mean, he can get taken down, but... He will attack off his back with Kimuras. He'll work his way back to top position. And uh, he was able to do that against a college wrestler and Dylan Lockhart in his last fight. He really dominated in the grappling realm. Ultimately submitted Lockhart. And Brown can get a little sloppy on bottom. He can give his back to stand up. He has been caught in uh, two rear naked chokes. But excellent cardio from Brown. He's never going to quit. And this should be a fun fight. On the feet, I actually believe Brown is more technical. I see him trying to get inside, initiate takedowns. And at range, he is a little stiff. And the style of Griffin, you know, darting in, darting out, being quick. He may have a little bit trouble with that straight left hand with the 1-2 or the head kick. And uh, maybe Griffin will be able to take out Brown, but I think Brown hits harder. And uh, Griffin can get a little bit wild in trade sometimes, where I feel that will favor TJ Brown if that is to happen. Griffin holds his hands low also, so, you know, maybe that head kick of Brown's could also come into play. As for the grappling, I just feel Brown's going to be stronger. I think he's going to be able to take down Griffin basically at will. I feel he's the bigger guy, and when he gets in on the legs or a body lock, Griffin's going to go down to me and... Brown, he's excellent at keeping top position. He's excellent at taking the back. And uh, Griffin seemingly gives up his back in every fight. I feel Brown should dominate positionally, land some big shots. And Griffin has proven to be very difficult to submit. And he also has some tricky submissions of his own. I mean, he'll attack the legs, then quickly transition to arm bars. He can be getting dominated and then find a funky submission. You know, we saw that in his fight against Derek Minner. If you guys haven't seen that fight in LFA, go watch it. You know, Minner, he's also on this card. He was tooling Jordan Griffin. I mean, he was beating him up in the first round, dominating the second round, and Griffin pulled an armbar out of nowhere and got the win. But uh, I think this is a good matchup for TJ Brown. Uh, um, my pick's going to be Brown via decision. I think that, you know, he's going to look good here and uh, get the victory. <laughs> man, another week, another terrible heavyweight UFC fight. But uh, here we go, man. Sergey Spivak taking it on Marcin Tybora. And um, Spivak, he is entering the betting favorite here, which <laughs> I don't know if I ever would have thought I would say that in a uh, UFC fight for Spivak. But uh, he was knocked out in less than a minute versus Walt Harris, but he did rebound and get that decision victory over Tai Tuivasa. And I feel, you know, maybe you have to throw that Harris fight out. He was 254.5 at the weigh-ins. He took that fight on short notice. In other fights, like his most recent one, he's 233. He rarely weighs over 240, so I feel he probably... Wasn't in good shape at all for that fight, but, you know, what happened was what happened, and he quit. So, you know, quitting doesn't have, it does have a little bit to do with cardio, obviously, but it's never a good look. But Spivak, he looks tall, he's long on the feet, he will stick a jab out there, one, two, good uh, jab right hook, and he has fast hand speed, he does you know, throw decently quick in combination inside, but when he's forced to throw longer, straighter punches on the outside, he kind of is a little bit stiff, and he's not as fast. He's more fast on the inside when he can implement knees, elbows, and uh, kind of uh, mix it up a little bit. He will throw some nice knees, head kicks, and he's very good when uh, he could back opponents against the cage. He's good at measuring opponents, uh, throwing big elbows, and uh, kind of picking his shots well. 
He definitely has good cardio. He can throw a lot of volume out there. He does stand heavy on his lead leg, and he has small legs. I don't think he's going to be able to take many low kicks. He did get swept off his feet with a low kick versus Tuivasa. He also doesn't deal with pressure very well, and uh, he kind of just covers up, waits for his moment, and then returns. But, um, you know, I feel like he gets better strikers. They're going to be able to hurt him when he does that. I am impressed with his volume for heavyweight, but doesn't hit hard. He isn't the greatest athlete. And a lot of his striking is just to close the distance. So, isn't a super dangerous striker. He does have four knockouts. And uh, he was finished that one time by Walt Harris. But Spivak, he's a strong grappler. He's pretty good in the clinch. He will close the distance with punches. He'll throw uh, elbows, knees, body head. And he's very good in top position. Body locks, head and arm throws. And, uh, you know, he will rain down big shots from the guard. Uh, he will you know, land some uh, punches from side control. He kind of likes to get that uh, that uh, neck crank from side control. He likes to uh, attack arm triangles from there as well. He can be a little bit sloppy, though, when he's going for those neck cranks, things like that. He can give up top position. He could, uh, you know, get swept. But uh, he will look for the bout. He's fast at scrambles. You know, I'm decently impressed with him on the bat. He also, in his last fight, was hitting... Uh, more traditional shots like blast doubles. He was able to tie when uh, Ty was throwing kicks to take him down off of that, which uh, showed a good ability for him to adapt because he wasn't doing that early in the fight. But uh, he can't struggle to hold opponents down. And uh, he definitely has good enough cardio to take down guys multiple times. We saw that with Tuivasa, which that's a good skill to have at heavyweight because if you could start slow cooking guys, then uh, you know eventually it's going to start being easier to, to uh, hold guys down. But you know, overall, I'm not super impressed with him for T. Poor man. I mean, you know, he's chased things up. He's at Syndicate MMA for this one. And, uh, you know, he is light on his feet. He has some decent kicks, straight punches, good right hook, a leaping straight left, uh, uppercut left hook combo. But, it, you know, he holds his hands low. He can't be hit clean. He squares up at times. On the feet, I definitely feel like he's going to be the better guy, though. I think that he's going to be the better striker. Um,. He has been knocked out, uh, you know, four times in his career and twice recently, back to back. So his chin may be gone, you know. But uh, if not, I do think he's going to be able to be the better striker. And his grappling isn't bad either. I mean, uh, he will look to uh, get double legs, body locks. Um, on top, he's pretty good. He has decent submissions. And, uh, you know, he was able to go all five rounds with a guy like Verdub, uh who has a lot of very good submissions. He survived on the ground with him. But, man, I mean, this is a tough fight for me to call. I think Sergey may be able to control against the cage, uh, get Tybura tired, um, land something to the clinch, control on top. But I feel Tybura is the better athlete, the better striker. Uh, I think if he fates, uses low kicks, controls distance, backs Spivak up, and keeps it standing, he's likely going to win. But I feel Tybura should look to, you know, get back up if taken down. And from what I saw of Spivak versus Ty, uh, maybe even get on top of him. I mean, this fight just comes down to how badly, you know, damaged goods is Tybora. Now, if he shows up, he should win this fight. I'm going to pick Tybora, but man, I mean, I have no idea really. So, uh, pick could be Marching Tybora here. And uh, I'm next sure we have Tom Breeze taking on Brandon Allen. And man, I mean, we all know the deal with Tom Breeze right now. You know, he's a guy that, he he pulls out of a lot of fights, man. I mean, and he has an issue with, um, with, uh, like, he has an issue where he has anxiety issues. He'll pull out of fights, like, the day of, in the locker room. I believe that's what he did in his last fight, or he pulled out, like, the night before. And he's done that multiple times. So, I imagine, you know, this is going to be probably the last chance for, uh, you know, Tom Breeze to actually get in that octagon and uh, fight. Because if he pulls out again because of anxiety issues, I don't know how the UFC could keep keeping him around. Because you're giving uh, fights to this guy against other people who are wanting to fight. And they go through whole training camps and then he doesn't fight. So it's like you can't continue to give uh, an opponent like that to fighters. But, uh, you know, when Tom Breeze gets in the cage, he's very good, man. He's a very tall fighter. And he's been putting a lot of priority in boxing and fighting long. So, you know, he said he's been working a lot on his boxing technique. And he has a long stance. He pumps out that jab, the straight left. He will, you know, feign and fake, uh, walk opponents down and keep him on the back foot. Good distance control. 
very accurate straight left hand. Uh, that's kind of what he uses to control the distance. And he has a nasty front kick to the body. Good jab left hook. He'll throw a nasty right hook straight left hand combination. Really nice uppercut right hook combo. Uh, nice inside outside leg kicks. Uh, you know, he'll throw Superman punches. Good head movement. Lateral footwork. And uh, uses length well to walk opponents into his shots. Pot shot him over three rounds. Very good hand speed. Keeps the volume high. You know, I think overall he's a very good striker. He does stand heavy on his lead leg. It is there to be leg kicked, but hard hit to the face. And uh, he has four knockouts. He only has one career fight that he's lost, which was a split decision. And he's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. Good ground game as well. Isn't an offensive wrestler. And his defensive wrestling is a little bit questionable, but... You know, he can be bullied in the clinch. He doesn't really have the greatest technique there. He doesn't dig underhooks. He'll just kind of try to stall out the position. Um, Keita Nakamura was able to take him down in the clinch multiple times. That was a long time ago. And he did look improved defending clinch takedowns, digging underhooks against Sean Strickland. Off his back, you know, he is very good. He will attack with leg locks. I feel like he's an, an elite leg lock guy for MMA. And he's also very... Uh, Good with triangles from from full guard. Brendan Allen definitely has to mind his P's and Q's if he takes top position. And, uh, you know, he's uh, he'll use these uh, leg locks to sweep as well. Once he gets on top, he's very good. He's very hard to buck off. Very good control. Uh, nice elbows. Uh, good crucifix and in, inside control. Good inverted triangles. He's a legit black belt, man. I mean, he's competed in EBIs. He has six submissions. And, uh, you know, he's a, I feel like he's a very skilled fighter. I mean, if he gets to the cage and he fights, uh, he's going to put on a very good performance usually. And, you know, he's a young guy. This is his first fight in almost two years. So who knows? I mean, maybe he'll come out here looking even better than the last time we saw him when he uh, knocked out Dan Kelly. So we're going to have to see with uh, Tom Breeze. But if he gets in that octagon, you know, he's usually a good fighter. And for Brendan Allen in his last fight, you know, he got a good win. He beat uh, Kevin Holland, who, you know, Holland did come in on short notice. He did look like he kind of gassed out. So maybe Allen got a little bit lucky there. But he looks really pretty solid. You know, technical striking. He definitely has power in his hands. Good jab, good hooks. He catches fighters uh, as he's moving backwards, which is a good trait. And uh, when he goes forward, he's super aggressive. He'll crash with hard punches, big knees. He'll attack the body. But his striking defense is not very good. He's very hittable. I feel like with the guy with the boxing of uh, of Tom Breeze, he could maybe even just win this fight solely off the jab. But Allen has power. He has four knockouts. Good chin. He's never been finished by strikes. He's willing to walk through punches, take one to give one. But in this fight, he should definitely be looking to get it to the mat. You know, he has strong takedowns, really good body locks, good double legs. And in top position, he has decent control, aggressive looking for the back. We saw that in his last fight. He'll work side control, look for Kimura's arm bars, good at creating scrambles. And, um, you know, in his last fight, he was able to go in there and submit a guy who's very tough to submit in Kevin Holland. Like I said, I do believe Kevin Holland, you know, taking that fight on short notice did get a little bit tired. But, you know, Brendan Allen still went in there and did the thing. So, you know, he went in there, he got the uh, submission. He's gotten two submissions back to back. Three of his last four fights, he's won via submission. And, um, you know, he's a guy that I would be very surprised to see him submit Tom Breeze, but I believe his path to victory in this fight would be taking Tom Breeze down, holding Tom Breeze down, and controlling him. So uh, that's kind of what I think his game plan is going to try to be here. But I just feel like Tom Breeze is better than him everywhere. He's better than him with the boxing, better than him with the, on the ground, more technical. He's taller, uh, um, you know. Allen has the range here, which, you know, could play a factor. But, you know, I feel like Breeze is better with the distance control. This is, uh, you know, I, I'm going to go with Tom Breeze. I feel like the line is close because of the other issues that Tom Breeze has outside of the cage. Not because of the actual performances that happen in the octagon. But with a guy like Tom Breeze, man, I mean, it's hard to trust him. You know, what if he has that brain uh, lapses that he's having in the locker room in the middle of the fight and just checks out? You know, then he wouldn't show his skill set. I'm going to look dumb picking him and he's going to look bad. But uh, I feel like if he goes out there and he performs to his true capabilities, Brendan Allen can't compete with him. So I'm going to Tom Breeze to get the victory. And now up next year we have Gabriel Silva taking on Kyler Phillips. And this is another uh, low-key fight that's pretty good. You know, Gabriel Silva, he is the brother of uh, Eric Silva. 
And he's going to be looking to bounce back following that loss to Ray Borg. That was his first loss of his career in his UFC debut. And uh, he has a very odd build. I mean, he's short and compact. He's 5'4", but he has a 71-inch reach, which is pretty crazy. And he switches stances. He pressures fairly well. Pretty explosive guy. And he usually starts southpaw. Good jab, good left hand from southpaw. He'll throw a 1-2 right hook. He likes to rip the body. Uh, very nice overhand left. He'll... Uh, you know, use the overhand left to crash and the hook combinations. And in orthodox, he'll throw a lot of uh, powerful lead right, lead left hooks. He's good at slipping, ducking punches in close range. Uh, coming back with a tight right hook, he packs power in uh, close distance. And he does look to, uh, you know, fight hands in close range. He has fast hands there as well. And he can get hit coming inside, though. He doesn't have the greatest defense entering uh, range. And he also doesn't have... Uh, you know, the longest reach when he throws kicks, obviously, because he's kind of short. So, uh, you know, he doesn't tend to throw a lot of kicks. And uh, on the outside, he's not as successful, even with the long reach, if someone could kick him on the outside. Because, you know, obviously, even though he has that long reach, if someone is a little bit taller, could keep on the outside of kicks, he could struggle a little bit. And a lot of the fights I was watching, he was fighting at 145. So I think he's going to be better sized for 35s. He did... Uh, you know, get a little bit tired in his Ray Borg fight, but that was a very high-paced matchup. He does have three knockouts. He's never been finished by strikes, and he looks to mix it up. I mean, he'll use blitz attacks, power punches to uh, fall into takedown attempts. He definitely has a nice single leg. Yes, uh, he's powerful, even at 145, and when he gets his hands connected, he'll uh, get good slams. And on top, though, I don't really like what I see. He doesn't have good top control, and he can be put in submissions. I've seen him... Uh, swept more than once with leg locks. He doesn't really pass very well. And uh, fighters are able to create scrambles and stand back up. He did hit a couple good switches and took the back array Borg. And he showed good back control. But didn't really attack the Rudy Kachoke. And he isn't a big submission guy. I mean, he only has one submission in his career. He did get out grappled pretty badly in that fight versus Ray Borg. Got very tired. And, uh, you know, Borg was able to show him that next level and put him in that wrestling grind. But... That's Ray Borg, man. I mean, we just saw what Ray Borg did in his last fight. And Kyler Phillips, he's completely different than Ray Borg. And he's going to be making his long-awaited UFC debut. I mean, he was set to debut in March of last year, but got forced out of that fight due to an injury. He hasn't fought uh, since then. And he did have a fight on the Data White Contender Series where he earned a victory. He also has a loss on Tough. So now he's finally getting the UFC opportunity in the main stage. He has two kind of you know, opportunities in the organization, but obviously wasn't in the big show. And he's very dangerous. He's very uh, dangerous in round one specifically. Very fast, tactical, explosive. And he can finish the fight on the feet or on the ground. And he has all his finishes in round one. As the fight goes on, definitely slows down. Isn't nearly as dangerous. Early in round one, man, he's lying on his feet. Great movement. He's bouncing in and out. Very nice lead hand, very fast, very sharp with his punches. He'll throw really nice one twos, uh, really good hooks, uppercuts, a uh, really nice tight left hook. Um, the best part of his stand up game is his kicking, though. He has very nice low kicks, really nice round kicks, body head. He'll throw spinning kicks, question mark kicks. In his last match, he landed a spinning back kick to the body to a question mark kick to the head and knocked his opponent clean out. Very dynamic. He has three knockouts in his career, never been finished by strikes. And he's well-rounded. He's a solid grappler. He's good at getting uh, to the clinch, working takedowns, along with taking the back from that position. He's always looking to take the back in grappling situations. And he doesn't seem the best at sticking the submission when he's in the back mount. But good at controlling there. He isn't bad at chain wrestling against the cage either. He'll take the mound. He'll land big shots from there. In his match with Victor Henry, he did win the grappling exchanges early in that fight against a pretty good grappler. But he gassed out. And definitely, as the fight went on, I would say he lost that fight due to being stuck on bottom. He isn't the greatest when dealing with forward pressure. His cardio isn't very good. He can get a little bit sloppy in grappling exchanges as the fight goes on. And he has a lot of potential, man. He's also a finisher. Um, he only has one uh, calf slicer submission. And both of his losses have came via split decision. So he fights close when it goes to decision a lot. He is young. He's a good prospect. And 
I see Phillips being able to dominate on the feet if he fights smart. He's way more dynamic than Silva, and he can move. Silva's flat-footed. He's not nearly as fast, and if he can make Silva overextend with punches and counter, faint moves, stay at kicking range, I think he's going to get the knockout. But Silva, he's going to want to close the distance, force grappling, boxing exchanges. He has power in his hands, and I think he has the better jiu-jitsu. And uh, maybe he could control in top position. He could break Phillips maybe with forward pressure, knock him out. And um, my pick's going to be Kyler Phillips, though, via first-round KO or decision. I think he's cleaner on the feet. I think he has good enough grappling to keep it where he wants it. And uh, both these guys have had cardio issues, so I don't trust that Silva's going to be able to push a pace that's going to break Phillips. So uh, my pick's going to be Kyler Phillips to actually go in there and get the first-round finish. Woo, man, here we go, baby. This is this is a fight that I like, man. This is a grappling special right here. Uh, and, you know... I really wish it was still Chas Skelly fighting him. You know, Grant Dawson, uh, he had a couple of those mishaps with USADA. He wasn't granted a license to fight in Nevada. And Chaz was ready to go there. And then when they changed it to Virginia, you know, Chaz, you know, he's an older guy. And they he had to do a back-to-back -back training camps. And he got injured, man. And now, you know, Chaz is thinking about retirement, which sucks, dude. I, I really hate that. But, uh... You know, Dawson, he's been allowed to fight here in Virginia, and he's going to be taking on Derek Minner now. Um, you know, and he's a, he's a grappler. He likes to keep pressure on opponents. Uh, usually opens up throwing a lot of kicks. He'll throw front kicks, round kicks. Likes to attack the body. Decent jab, good long right hooks. He'll throw uh, side, um, you know, nice uh, side kicks in combination. Decent, uh, decent right hooks as well. And uh, he'll mix in uppercuts. He's good at slipping uh, punch, landing a left or a right hook or an overhand. He'll also attack the body off of slips, good kicks. And, uh, you know, when he's a speed advantage, he'll walk you down, make you pay. Um, you know, start to mix it up with the wrestling. But he can be uh, very aggressive and almost to a fault, you know, have some reckless abandon. He's uh, shown a good chin, but it's a risky style to just go forward and wear punches and get hit. But... I think he does that because of his cardio. He wants to wear guys down and take them out. And uh, he's a grinder, man. I mean, he's still developing as a striker. But his aggression, and he doesn't mind being hit, I think that's going to make him go a long way. Because when you're a grappler and you don't mind getting hit, then you're going to be able to get inside easier. And uh, if you have a good chin, you're probably going to be able to implement your game most of the time. He's only 25 years old, so I definitely expect improvements from him. And he's a very good grappler. He's a much better grappler than striker. He's great timing on his double legs. Uh, when he gets on top, he goes to work immediately. Big ground and pound. You'll posture, land big straight punches, hammer fist, elbows. Kind of, uh, you know, slowly wears on opponents in a position. Then you'll pass. Uh, move to dominant positions like the mound. You'll throw big ground and pound. Good rear naked chokes when opponents give their backs. Um, he's a bit of a rear naked choke specialist, actually. I mean, he has five career rear nakeds. He will also attack with front chokes like Darces, Anacondas, Guillotines. Great cardio, and usually once he gets one takedown, he's probably going to get another one and another one and another one and just diminish his opponent. He has nine submissions. He's never been submitted, and uh, he's just the definition of a grinder, man. But I'm excited for Derek Minner's debut. I'm happy he got the got the fight here. This is a guy that's been grinding out on the regional scene. Fought a lot of tough competition. He's had some close fights. He's had a lot of fights where he's been dominating the fight, then lost. And uh, he's getting the short nose call here. Um, I guess he did make a good impression on the Nita White Contender Series. He took it to Herbert Burns, man. I mean, he had Herbert into bad situations. Uh, he hurt him on the feet. He took his back, but he then eventually got submitted in that fight. But he's followed that up with two finishes on the regional scene. Uh, he beat uh, Terrence McKinney, who was another fighter that fought in the Dana White Contender Series very quickly. And he's a guy that comes in the cage with bad intentions, man. He's ready to go right away. He's a first-round finisher, man. He'll take you out quickly if you are ready to go. I mean, his last three wins have came in under two minutes. He's finished 20 wins in the first round of the 24 fights, many in the first two minutes. So, I mean, this guy usually, I mean, in the first round, he's usually... You'd have to go look at his fights. He has been finished in the first round of some fights. But I bet you he's winning in the first round of almost every single fight that he's fought in his entire career. And, uh, 
You know, he has been finished five times in round one, but even a lot of those times he's winning until he gets finished. So, style can work both ways. He's very aggressive looking for the finish, but puts himself in positions to get finished. He's a boxer wrestler who throws bombs. Isn't really technical with the feet, but he has power. He'll commit to a strike, you know. He'll wing clubbing overhands. Uh, I've seen him drop opponents. You know, he will close distance with hooks, uppercuts. He really uses the striking to get it on the legs, though. He'll throw a lot of uh, kicks also. Front kicks up the middle, round kick spot he had. He's decent moving in and out. He will sometimes load up with the kicks. It can be countered. And he will also throw a lot of lead uppercuts that leave him exposed. He can be very sloppy after the first round. His strength can kind of become winged hooks. He'll run into punches. And uh, when Mitter's opponents uh, you know, start to find their rage, he can kind of struggle to get inside. But when he hurts opponents, he's not looking to finish by strikes. He's going into submission mode. He only has one career knockout. He has been finished by strikes twice, but he's very durable. I mean, the times he's been finished were ground and pound, where he wasn't out, but he just couldn't get out of a position. And when he gets hurt, he recovers very quickly. He is a great striker, but he commits, and it opens up his wrestling. And he's a strong grappler, extremely opportunistic, aggressive. He sacrifices position for submission every time with no regrets. Uh, he's good at using big punches to set up the entries to his double legs, good singles. And when he takes opponents down, he's immediately looking to rain down ground upon hunting that neck. He's good at taking the back. He'll lock in rear naked chokes in transitions. And when he catches guys, uh, you know, he he really, really attacks that neck heavy. I mean, you can tell he's really squeezing it as hard as he can. He'll dive on front chokes. His guillotines are very slick. He has a ton of guillotine finishes. And he can sometimes get himself in trouble due to hunting the sub. I mean... He will attack knee bars, get mounted. He'll dive on guillotine, put himself on bottom. But he has decent submission defense. Uh, he can get submitted. And he also can stay in bad positions, turtle up, and kind of allow fighters to p pound him out and finish the fight. And he can get a little bit sloppy and set opponent's guard to get submitted with triangles, arm bars. He has been taken down himself, and his game off his back is not very good. He doesn't have a great get-up game. He isn't a huge submission threat. But he did recently get a triangle choke, and he will use the guillotine to stand up from inside his guard. He has been submitted, uh, you know, several times in his career, but he has 21 submissions of his own. So, I mean, he's going in there to get the sub usually. Uh, you know, he has grit, he has heart. His cardio isn't the best. He will slow down after the first round, but he's a veteran. He knows kind of how to, uh, you know, control the pace even when he's tired and fight through fatigue. But this is a tough assignment here on his first time out. I just feel like Dawson's going to be able to take him down and control him, man. I just think that's going to be the tale of the fight. Uh, we saw Chico Camus implement that game plan against Mitter. And I just feel like it's going to be a lot of uh, Dawson taking him down, rinse and repeat, control it on top. Uh, I think he's probably going to be able to finish him because I think Mitter's going to get tired. I do think in the first round, though, man, I mean... Mitter can finish him in the first round. Stranger things have happened. Mitter's a guy that comes out there and goes to work in that first round. So, if he goes out there and gets a first round finish over Grant Dawson, that's his path to victory here. But, my pick's going to be Grant Dawson to uh, maybe survive an early storm and get the finish or win a decision. This fight, man, I really don't have a ton to say about this fight. Um, but, Megan, she's going to be looking to win her second fight in a row in the UFC. She did get that first round finish over Zyra Faird, who we're going to talk about later. Uh, via submission, which was uh, pretty surprising. But you know, everyone knows about Anderson now. She's six feet tall. She's a huge woman, pretty athletic, and uh, good power to hands, good jab, uh, good straight right hand, overhand left. Uh, you know, she'll definitely, you know, attack in close range with spinning attacks, knees, elbows, and she's very dangerous on the feet. She throws a ton of volume. Uh, she's finished uh, four wins via KOTKO. She's never been finished by strikes. And, uh, you know, her kryptonite is bitter grappling, but she did win via triangle in her last fight. You could tell it was very big for her to do that. She has showed bad takedown defense when she fought against Felicia Spencer. She also showed very uh, bad submission defense when Spencer was on her back. She's also been submitted by Sydney Danwa. In this fight, she probably will have to deal with some, some takedown defense from Dumont, but... Norma Dumont, she's going to be making her UFC debut. She's 4-0. She hasn't fought in about a year and a half. I'm not really sure why, but she's finally getting back in there. And she's a Santa black belt. She's Brazilian, but she's normally a 35er. There's not really much to say about Dumont because there is only one fight of hers online. The fight was against an 0-3 opponent. And that fight, you know, she did look decently quick on the feet. Uh, 
She was picky at her shots. She was landing some pretty stinging shots. Uh, heavy low kicks, body kicks. She'll come in with uh, nice one twos. She had pretty quick hands. And, you know, I don't really think she's defensively sound with the boxing, though. She looks like she's more uh, comfortable throwing kicks and being on the outside, being defensive. But, you know, I haven't seen very much of her grappling either. I have seen her get a couple takedowns in the clinch. She looks like she has some nice trips, good throws. And uh, in top position, you know, she was able to get to mount, rain down shots, and did force that opponent to give her back and took her out. Her two victories uh, have came via Rudy Kachok, her two finishes. And uh, she looks like a solid athlete, uh, all-around skills. She still is very green, though. She only has four fights. She hasn't faced very good competition. And due to that, I'm going to pick Megan because, you know, I just haven't seen enough from uh, Norma. I mean, Norma may go in there and get the win, but I've only seen one fight of Norma as it gets to 0-3 girls. So, hard to make a pick on this fight. Uh, Dubot doesn't look bad, but she doesn't look great defensively. She looks a little bit small. Uh, she's less experienced. So, I'm going to say uh, Anderson wins via decision or TKO. Woo! Up next here, we got another really nice fight. You know, Jan Kutulava taking Magomed and Kalaev. Uh... You know, these are two guys that are two bruisers, man. I mean, both these guys have big knockout power. They're very athletic. I mean, two of the most athletic guys in the 205-pound division, if you ask me. And uh, Yad, he's more of an exploder. He's a guy that comes out. He's light on his feet, a lot of movement, a lot of spinning attacks. He's coming in with big one-twos, full power on his punches, Really nice elbows as well. Uh, good knees in the clinch. He's brutal. He's ruthless. Uh, you know, he's really improved his takedown defense as well. So he's getting better at keeping it on the feet, keeping it in his, realm, in his realm. And he has wrestling of his own in his back pocket. He showed that off uh, in his fight against uh, Kilo Rautry his last time out. He got on top of those brutal elbows. But the problem with Yod is he does slow down, and a lot of his shots come a little bit wide. I mean, he will throw some straight one-twos, but he'll throw a lot of uh, hook combinations, a lot of wide shots, and he get countered with straighter, tighter punches, which I believe is what Magomed is much better at. I mean, Magomed, to me, is better with the distance control. He, uh, you know, controls... His, he's more composed as well. His cardio is much better. He fates a lot more than uh, Yod. Yod will switch stances. He's I would say he's more dynamic in terms of uh, he'll attack spinning attacks. He can throw maybe flying knees, things like that. But Ikalaev, you know, he's more technical. He has a really nice jab, really good boxing, really straight punches, tight punches. He uh, stays very composed, good wrestling himself. Good kicks. I mean, we saw him lay that front kick to the face that knocked out uh, uh, Doucher Champion. And I feel like Doucher Champion is kind of a similar matchup to Yon. A guy who, who is an exploder on the feed, has big power, can throw some uh, interesting techniques, but really has a wrestling base and, you know, can rely on the wrestling to win fights when they can get out grappled or when, they can get, when they're getting outstruck. But the thing is here for me is I believe that and Kalaev, he has the better striking, he has the better cardio, and probably has the better wrestling. So, you know, he is a little bit hittable, which, uh, you know, in that first round, Yod is going to come hard, he's going to come heavy. And uh, if Yod catches him in that first round clean, he could knock him out. But we've seen when he fights guys like Glover Teixeira, when he fights guys like uh, Jared Cannonier. After that first round, he still has some decent power, decent hand speed. But very much diminished. Guys can start to walk him down. They can eat his shots. And he's a little bit of a glass cannon, man. When he starts to get hit, when he starts getting pressured, he could, uh, you know, look for ways out. He could look a little bit uh, bewildered in there. Like, he doesn't want to be in there. And I feel like Magomed, uh, I just think he's a little bit better overall everywhere. I think he's cleaner a little bit. I think he's better with his composure. Um, so, uh, I'm going to go with Magomed and Kalaev. To go in there and get it done via finish in the second or the third round. But, you know, looking at the money line for this fight, I do kind of believe it's dog or pass. Because Yad, he's a big, dangerous guy in that first round. And uh, he could go in there and get it done in the first round. Uh, Late minus 250 on Ankoliev. Uh, that is a little bit steep. But uh, I do think Ankoliev should win this fight. And up next year, uh, the co-main event, uh, co event to a title fight in the UFC. Felicia Spencer versus Zyra Fard. I mean, yeah, man, you're really uh, giving Joe B and Davidson a really nice co-main here with these two. But, uh, yeah, Felicia, pff, 
She uh, suffered a beatdown against Chris Cyborg. I mean, she fought valiant valiantly for three rounds, and she was even able to cut Cyborg with an elbow. I would say she raised her stock, and she's three and zero. Oh, you know, she's facing. Er, she's not three and zero. Oh, what am I saying? She she's taking on a girl Zara Fart who's six and three, and you know, foreign. She's out of France, and you know, this is kind of an example of the shallowness of this woman's featherweight division. Felicia Spencer. She recently finished Megan Anderson in round one. She's now facing an opponent who Megan Anderson finished in round one just four months ago. And I know MMA math doesn't work, but Spencer is a massive favorite for a reason here. And uh, you know, her gr she's a grappler, good kicks, not really much boxing. Uh, she'll throw some Superman punches, Superman elbows, and she did show up some nice elbows in her last match. I mean, she still grabs one in boxing range, but you can tell she's improving her footwork. She isn't as hittable. She'll look for a left hook. She has a decent left hook straight right hand. She has good pressure. She cuts the cage off well, and I was very impressed with how composed she stayed under fire against Cyborg. I mean, she showed she could eat, take a lot of damage, and uh, continue to try to win, most specifically. A lot of girls, you know, they'll take damage and, and they're able to survive, but she took damage and she was still trying to win, which is, you know, very good to see. There's a lot of leg kicks. I feel like some of her leg kicks are a little bit lazy, but, uh, you know, in this fight, I don't know. She won't have to worry about too much, I don't think. She still body kicks, uh, jab, body kick. Uh, she kind of uh, has some decent kicks up the middle. And she's a solid grappler. I mean, we saw that against Megan Anderson. She got in the double underhook, circled to the back, took the back very nicely. Uh, she has very nice trips, single legs. Uh, using the single to circle to the back is really what she's very good at. And her back takes are excellent. I mean, she'll flatten opponents out. Very nice rear naked chokes. Um, her takedowns really to me aren't super great, but... Uh, you know, in this fight, I kind of feel like if she can get into the clinch, she's going to get the takedown. She's finished five of her seven wins, four submissions, uh, nice running could choke in her debut against Anderson. And uh, for Farn, you know, she did suffer that setback last fight. Uh, you know, Anderson isn't known for her ground game, so to get submitted by Anderson is pretty alarming. But, uh, you know, she's going to likely need to land a Bob takes bets her out to win here. It's tough for me to see... Far and improving much either from fight to fight or doing much in the UFC, but she's already 35 years old. Um, she has been training at a good gym. She's at All Stars Training Center. I don't think necessarily she looks old out there, but she's just not that good. I mean, in her fight with Megan Anderson, she did start fast. She blitzed with this, some straight punch combinations. Uh, she has a decent jab. I mean, she's shown that offensive fight. She has some kicks, but she closes the distance with her strikes. Uh, and, you know, Anderson was able to clinch up with her almost immediately, and her, her grappling looks almost non-existent. Uh, Megan Anderson, I mean, she's not known as a grappler, and she made her far made her look like Hoyce Gracie, man. I mean, Anderson was able to hit a body lock immediately, took the mount. Uh, Fart showed little to no defense on the mat. She was pieced up with the elbows. Uh, she kind of made a hasty move to escape, put in a triangle, got submitted. And if she gets taken out by Felicia, it's very likely the fight ends shortly after. This fight should be a formality, man. I mean, we saw Spencer was able to cut the cage off, get Cyborg against the cage controller there. She did the same thing to Anderson, and she was able to eat a ton of damage against Cyborg. She gave some of her own. She's very tough. Uh, Zarn, you know, having the takedown defense of Cyborg, I don't think so. And she isn't refined anyways. Her striking closes the distance for her opponents. If she wants to defeat Spencer, I mean, her game plan would be to use her length move, which I just don't think she's capable of. I feel like one takedown is going to lead the win for Spencer. Um, so, you know, I see that takedown happen in the first round. So I'm going to say Spencer wins via first round su submission here. And up next here we finally have the main event. It's the uh, UFC Flyweight Championship on the line here. Joseph Benavidez, Divas at Figueredo. And uh, Benavidez, you know, he's looking for another crack at UFC gold here. And uh, he's arguably the best fighter in UFC history never to be champion. So we're going to see if he can finally achieve that goal. This will be a second consecutive, uh, or this will be the sec second consecutive trading camp for his team, Extreme Couture against Figueredo. So they should have a good understanding of what uh, Figueredo's tendencies are, what he wants to do. And, um, you know, Figueredo, he's... Uh, Getting a big chance here. I mean, he's relatively an unknown name still, even though he's done very well in the UFC. He's a finisher. He's uh, getting a big chance here to become UFC champion. I'm sure the UFC wants uh, Benavides to win uh, marketability-wise, but, uh, you know, uh, we'll see what happens. And Benavides, you know, he's a super explosive athlete. He really relies on that on the feet. He keeps his hands low, uses a lot of movement, fake feints. 
uh, finds his opening, closes his distance, and uh, he's very explosive, extremely fast, and he's a solid jab, good straight left hand, inside, outside, low kicks, round kicks to the body, to the head, uh, good job of setting up his kicks with feints, he'll also throw them at the end of combinations, he'll uh, throw front kicks, head kicks, uh, you know, his most devastating strikes are definitely his hooks and his overhands. Uh, landed a big overhand that stumbled uh, um, Alex per Perez, and he eventually took him out. He landed a really nasty left hook in his last fight against Formiga. Hurt him, swarmed him, took him out. Uh, really excellent performance there from Benavidez. And, uh, man, I mean, when he's closing that distance with his blitz attacks, he's extremely explosive. And even when you blitz him, he'll blitz back. Very explosive. Kind of similar to... Uh, how John Dotson caught uh, Nathaniel Wood, where Wood blitzed him, he blitzed back, was just a little bit faster. And, uh, you know, he can struggle a little bit, like when he fought against Sergio Pettis, though, with guys you can control distance and uh, counter with clean, tight punches, which is what uh, um, Deveson is going to try to do in this fight. But I don't think Deveson is as clean with the footwork or with the uh, punching as uh, Sergio is. But he definitely hits harder, so Benavides has to be very careful not to run into something. And uh, Benavides, he's only been finished by strikes one time in his career, though. And he has eight knockouts on his record. He's a phenom wrestler, man, uh, offensively and defensively. Excellent in the clinch. Uh, really nice uh, uh, plum clinch. He'll blast knees, body head, short uppercuts in the single collar. Good job landing shots off the break. He'll attack knees, overhands, uppercuts, disengaging. Uh, great takedowns in the clinch. He's one of the most physically strong, uh, you know, flyweights of all time. Really na nasty slam takedowns. Uh, his style blitzing in with 3-4 hook overhands makes it easier for him to duck under as well. If they're worried about getting hit, he'll just duck under, land the double. Very active on top. He'll attack with nasty ground and pound elbows. He was able to take out Alex Perez in that wrestling ride position. Uh, he'll just uh, finish fights with uh, ground and pound very well. And he'll move to mount where he'll look for the finish. He'll try to snatch the guillotine. Uh, great takedown defense as well, man. I mean, when you take him down, he's usually going to scramble and end up on top. So, I mean, uh, he's even said that in interviews. I mean, if you take me down, it's basically like taking down yourself. And uh, extremely hard to hold down. I mean, almost impossible. Never been submitted in his career. Um, nine submissions himself. And for Deveson Figueredo, he's probably one of the biggest flyweights on the roster. And he maybe has the most one-punch knockout power as well. But on the feed, he's pretty basic. Uh, you know, he cuts the cage off. He'll switch stances. He likes to kind of almost have that, uh, you know, I like to call it, you know, the air guitar position. You know, where he has the arm out. He's kind of uh, gauging distance with the lead hand where he has the rear hand cocked. And uh, both hands are kind of low. But he's kind of just trying to bait you in trying to maybe uh you know use his front hand to gauge the distance a little bit bait you in and pull counter with that rear hand and uh you know very nice jab you'll skip in a range with the one two heavy low kicks powerful straight overhand right um he kind of likes to shuffle in a range and then explode into a left or right hook into and then an overhand following it he will attack the body as well very nice uppercuts uh, he kind of loads up on shots, but he's gotten better at throwing standing elbows, front elbows, and, uh, you know, that kind of uh, helps him in the pocket. Instead of loading up, he'll be very quick at the elbows. They can cut guys open like they did with Pantoja. But, uh, you know, he kind of waits a lot. He goes second. He can be kind of low volume, and he will send the pocket trade wild, and that's a little bit dangerous against Joseph Benavidez, um, you know, uh, we saw against uh, Pantoja, Figueredo hit a lot of big shots. But uh, Figueredo will also get frustrated, use a lot of lunging, big movements, which kind of can make it easier to catch up with counter shots and get takedowns. But in his last fight, I will say he was definitely more composed or in his fight with Pantoja. In his last fight, it was very quick. But, uh, you know, his opponent in Pantoja was a lot more willing to engage with Figueredo than I think uh, Joe B is going to be. And uh, Figueredo has 8 KO, TKOs. He's never been finished by strikes. And he struggled with grapplers over his career, man, though. He has gotten a victory by the skin of his teeth against Jared Brooks. Uh, he was taken down many times in that fight. He lost a fight to Formiga where he was taken down. And uh, even Pantoja was able to take him down several times. And, you know, Formiga was able to cement position, control the round. So was Jared Brooks. Pantoja, not so much. But Figueredo doesn't have the greatest takedown defense or get-up game. I mean, uh... 
you know, off of his back, he really doesn't do much. I mean, you'll try to play the guard gate, control posture, land elbows, punches, attack with the guillotine. But, uh, I mean, he doesn't have the greatest get-up game. He did cut Formiga with the elbow on bottom. And, uh, you know, he will look to push the hips, uh, try to stand up. And, uh, you know, his, his guillotine is dangerous. I mean, we did see him catch... Uh, Jared books that guillotine several times, almost submitted him. He caught Tim Elliott, did submit Tim Elliott, who is Joseph Benavidez's his teammate with that guillotine. He doesn't really use the guillotine to sweep the top position, though, so if he doesn't get it, he ends up on his back, and I think it's going to be very hard to get a guillotine on a guy like Joe B, especially after he just saw his trading party get caught at that. Um, in full guard, you know, he doesn't really throw up many submissions. Deveson isn't super dangerous other than with the guillotine uh, with any submissions overall, really, at all. And, uh, you know, he did land a nice blast double in his fight with Pantoja. Wasn't really able to control position. I don't see him being able to control Joe B or even take him down or try to take him down. In this fight, you know, Figure has to be stay composed. He has to try to cut Benavidez off, not get frustrated by the movement, catch him as he's coming in, use his straight right hand, uppercut, flying knees maybe even. And if he gets taken down, work back to his feet as quickly as possible, uh, continue to pressure, try to get Benavidez tired. But, you know, the thing about it is I feel like Benavidez, he's going to come in here with a good game plan, I feel like. I think that he's going to, you know, be low volume, set up low kicks, attack a lot of low kicks. And I think he's going to try to touch uh, Deveson, get him a little bit frustrated, and get takedowns, man. Because we've seen time and time again, man, that Deveson can't defend takedowns. He can't defend double legs. He cannot defend double legs. He really can't. He'll only use the guillotine. And if he catches the guillotine on Joe B, then he's going to win the title. But if Joe B can start taking him down, can start grinding on him, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of trouble there for Deveson. I do feel like Deveson's going to be live throughout the whole fight because he comes in in shape. And, uh, you know, if he could land a shot on Joe's chin, he could take him out. But I feel like as the fight goes on, Joe's going to be taking him down. He's going to be hitting that leg. And I think that Deveson's going to start really, really uh, expecting that takedown. He's going to start getting hit with the overhands, getting hit with more strikes on the feet. I do feel like standing up. If Joe B can't get the takedown or if he comes out early, he doesn't threaten the takedown for like in the first five minutes or the first few minutes of the fight, he gets caught. I think Deveson is kind of levels above Joe on the feet and Joe's a little bit hittable. So it is a little bit dangerous on the feet early in rounds for Joe B, especially before he's established his wrestling or if he can't establish his wrestling. I do think the speed could potentially bail him out, but you know... On the feet, it would be, make me a little bit nervous. But uh, I'm going with Joseph Benavidez. I feel like Joe B is the better all-around fighter. He has great cardio. He knows this is his last chance to get the get the UFC title here. And he's been looking, you know, downright phenomenal in his last fights. I mean, we saw what uh, Formiga did to Davidson Figueredo. Joe B finished that guy. Joe B finished Alex Perez that's been running rough shot through the division as well. And he's just been looking very, very good recently. He looks like he's kind of got a new lease on life. He's traded out in Las Vegas at the UCPI and Extremes. And, uh, yeah, he looks like he's good. So, I'm picking Joseph Benavidez to finally claim gold, become the UFC flyweight champion, and uh, get the win here. And, you know, these guys have been talking back and forth. They have a little bit of a beef. So, you know, I expect this fight to be fun. I expect it to be a good fight. And uh, I'm good with Joseph Benavidez to get it done. And uh, for my most confident pick of the week this week, uh, it's going to be Felicia Spencer. I just don't really see any way that she could lose that fight. Uh, really don't. I mean, I feel like she's almost like a, she should be like minus 2,000 favorite even. But uh, this week, I'm not going to give you guys a parlay. I'm going to give you guys actually a play of the week just because I don't really uh, like too many parlays. I'm going to go with Sean Brady for the play of the week. I really feel like even though he's the underdog, I feel like he should be a decent favorite. I think he's going to get the win here. I really do. I really like the matchup for Brady. And for the underdog of the week, I'm going to say TJ Brown is the underdog of the week. So, yeah, guys, thanks for rocking with me. Thanks for listening to the podcast. And uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Make sure to uh, comment, like, subscribe. Uh, hopefully you guys learned some new information. And uh, let's, have watch it. let's have fun watching these fights on Saturday.